Guys, so we'll start to cover in the next 30 minutes uh, everything around Hypercasual. My name is Nadav. If you don't know me, I have a very warm place in my heart for this event. I ran the first three that we had. Um, I've been with Aronsos for seven years, most of the time in the monetization and uh, mediation uh, business side. And two and a half years ago, I moved to Supersonic to open Aronsos Publishing uh, activity, and this is what we've been doing in the past 2.5 years. Important note, and I will ask for your forgiveness in advance, during the next 30 minutes, I'm going to divide the mobile games world into hyper-casual and non-hyper-casual. I know that non-hyper-casual is about 50x bigger than hyper-casual, but still, for the sake of this discussion, this is how I'm going to treat the different genres uh, in this presentation. Right? Some people call it a business model, genre, we will touch this as well, and what is the difference versus other games, how hyper-casual ecosystem evolved in the past five, six, seven years, which is very, very amazing, and We'll look at a wider overview about the mobile games, ecosystem, hyper-casual, non-hyper-casual, how do they impact each other, and whether there is a correlation between them, and we will try to predict what is next for hyper-casual. So let's start. What is hyper-casual? Many tend to look at it as a business model. I don't think that hyper-casual is a business model, right? The business model of hyper-casual is the same business model as any other mobile game. You need to have LTV bigger than CPI, LTV in this case is being generated mainly by ads, but it doesn't change the business model, right? It's the same for solitaire games, worlds, puzzle, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and many others that are generating uh, the revenue from ads. So what is hypercasual? In my eyes, hypercasual is two main things. One, it's a type of entertainment that is designed for short sessions. Uh, in my eyes, hypercasual games will compete with TikTok and Instagram for the screen time of the user more than with an RPG game, as an example. So it's somewhere in the middle between a social platform activity to a, a game where you use two, three minutes on your bus between meetings just to clean your head and do something that is entertaining. And this is one design, and, and the second point is that hypercasual is designed for mobile users and not mobile gamers. We want, and every hypercasual is being built, should be played, or at least can be played, by anyone, right? I always give my dad the new game and tell him, okay, let's see if you can play it in 20 seconds. If you understand the tutorial, the mechanic, how do you play the goal in 20, 25 seconds? If yes, in my eyes, this is what hypercasual needs to achieve. And these two important elements that dictate what hypercasual is leads to few important characteristics of hypercasual. It needs to be simple, right? Because we need everyone, every mobile user to be able to play it. Uh, but still fun, because we also need this 45% day one, just like mid-core or casual uh, uh, game will need. So it needs to be simple and fun. It's not that easy to achieve this combination. It needs to have a very simple user interface and uh, onboarding, right? We tend to say that hyper-casual shouldn't have a tutorial. If you need to have a tutorial in a hyper-casual game, like you do in any other casual or mid-core game, it's already not in hyper-casual, and probably it will be less likely to succeed, and it needs to be divided into short sessions so you can consume this type of entertainment in one, two, three minutes and move on with your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, life. And this product features or description leads to a few interesting things. First of all, of course, that the simplicity come, comes with a price, right? The engagement is lower versus a very long uh, uh, late retention uh, games. And this, of course, generates a bit of a lower LTV. And because LTV on hypercasual game will be 50, 60, 70 cents in the US. Mass audience is crucial to make it an interesting business model, right? If you have an RPG game with $20 LTV per user, then 10 million installs is already an interesting business model. But if you are generating 70 cents per user and 20 cents profit per user, then you need to get tens of millions of installs in order to be a, a, an interesting thing. And, and this is why scale is a must, and we're going to touch it. And this is how this ecosystem was built. On top of that, because of the simplicity of, of the product, as we said, the entrance barrier is lower. It led to have many, many, many creator for hyper, creator for hyper casual games around the world, right? From one man show, 19 years old person that build hyper casual games to a small team. Um, not as casual games will need 20, 30, 40 people team to raise money, to build for two uh, years. And this is what led to this indies and publishers ecosystem, many creators have very uh, strong talent with low entrance barrier, and they need this publisher to help them to scale their game and make business out of it. And this need for marketability, which is very, very hard, right? Outside of the 
hyper-casual ecosystem, it's, it might seem easy to find a marketable game, right? A any one of you can say, hey, I can think tomorrow about a gameplay or about a theme that will be interesting for hundreds of millions of uh, people in the US and worldwide, but it's not that easy. And in general, about 80% of the prototype are being killed on the marketability side. When I look at the new prototype, I always fail to, to predict if it's going to be marketable or not, because you cannot enter the brain of tens of millions of American people in each gender, age, and everything, and how will they react. So because marketability is so hard, you need to fail quick and fail cheap, right? So today we guide our community to work on a prototype before it's being tested for the marketability for no more than three days, four days, 10 levels max. If you are invested three weeks and build 50 levels before you did the marketability test, you waste your time because 85% is going to fail and you will lose your energy before you find your first hit or marketable concept. And this has led, of course, to a very advanced marketability test because it's very, very hard to predict the marketability power of a prototype with 300, 400, 500 uh, 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 dollars of investment. So this is what hypercasual is. What happened with the uh, ecosystem, right? Does hypercasual today is what hypercasual was five years ago? Um, let's look how it evolved over the years. So hypercasual started way back in 2013. Flappy Bird is perceived to be the first hypercasual mobile uh, game. Then Catch Up came a year after, right, with their own hypercasual games, and they said, okay, this is a, a fun and, and 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 cool feature. Probably we cannot do user acquisition because we cannot compete with Machine Zone that is paying $10 per install. How can we compete by users? So Catch Up Fundamentals was cross-promotion and moving users between their own games. Then came Voodoo in 2017 and actually proved the world that you can compete with Machine Zone on winning impression as an advertiser. That even if you bid 40 cents and Machine Zone bids $10, you can win the impression if your ad creative is converting well enough and of course, that after they succeeded in 2017 with several launches, one after another, it led to this red ocean that everybody is jumping into this growing ecosystem, right? With the app loving that came with Lion, Good Job Game, Say Game, Crazy Lab, which down the road is, is going to be acquired by Embracer, Quali, and many of you guys. A year after, Rolik is coming, mainly with the Turkish uh, 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 geo that uh, uh, is growing a lot for games after the success of Peak and after the uh, macroeconomic uh, situation in, in, in Turkey. And last but not least, Supersonic is coming in 2020. And uh, uh, this is how it evolved from publisher perspective. Let's look at games. So it started at 2D, quite simple, very repetitive mechanic, right? So if, if, if you look at Flappy Bird or even a, a, a Helix Jump, which became already 3D, you probably play 100 levels. The mechanic is the same. Nothing is really progressed over time. You're just getting different complexity and different, level of, uh, 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 different levels in the game itself. Then, with the entrance of many, many uh, competitors into this market, hypercasual start evolving into many different subgenres, right? Suddenly, we saw, start seeing simulation game or ASMR games. Then, say game who came with Johnny Trigger, which was perceived to be the first hybrid hypercasual mass audience, short sessions, but on the other hand, IAP monetization as well, and strong late retention. And it keeps evolving with Runners 2.0 that, that evolves to mechanics and puzzle games and first-person action and TikTok-based games, right? During COVID, TikTok grew a lot. And suddenly people say, hey, if we see a, a, a very viral video on TikTok, why not making a game out of it? And it worked. In 2021, we saw millions of uh, 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 and many of uh, uh, successful games coming from TikTok. And in the past year, it's hyper idle that uh, is becoming uh, uh, very strong in hypercasual. And again, we can dive deep into the subgenre in hypercasual and how they evolved over time, all the ones that I mentioned. But in general, we see that hypercasual became much more rich, execution level went up, and this added a lot of value and a lot of content for users that are looking to play hypercasual games. But not only the games evolved, also the uh, uh, meta and loop behind it. In the first few years of Hypercasual, main meta was skins, right? So you were gaining coins, then you use these coins to buy skins, which will change the look and feel of the game, but nothing else uh, and nothing beyond that. And what we see lately is that Hypercasual games start adding a meta and start having a loop, 
where you play, you earn virtual goods, then you invest it in upgrading your skills or having a different experience, then you play more and you earn more, etc. We also see second meta level, where you are in end of level building something, which gives you, again, another feeling of progression, another goal to uh, advance. The, uh, we see it both in the casual and in the hyper-casual games, for instance, all Playrix games as, as an example. And skins, which were the meta of hyper-casual in the past, became just a progression gift you get over time while playing hyper-casual games. Hyper-casual games are being developed much quicker today, right? I said three, four days, it wasn't the case a few years ago. It's a lot thanks to Unity, amaz amazing age engine, you should all use it. Um, the game quality improved, as uh, I said, more accurate marketability prediction, Nimrod spoke about it yesterday. We worked with Ironsoft together, Supersonic and Ironsoft, for a year to try and build a way to still invest only $500 in a marketability test and get a prediction whether this game is going to be marketable over SDKs, right? For, a, for the very first two-thirds of hyper-casual ecosystem, you're just uploading campaign to Facebook. If CPI is below 25 cents, this is marketable. If not, it isn't. Many, many missed opportunities and, and, and failures happened because of this. Many games will keep entering iteration and launch, and then suddenly you discover that the audience size on Facebook with this 20 cent CPI is very, very limited. And once you scale it, it isn't marketable as you thought, or vice versa. You would drop a prototype with a potential because Facebook CPI on this specific time wasn't as good as you thought, and you would miss this potential and someone else would pick it. Today, marketability is very different, right? Today, for instance, what Supersonic is doing, we're doing several channels, so Facebook, TikTok, uh, Iron Source. We're looking way beyond what CPI is. We look at gender split, at age, at IPM distribution, and we are able to predict and to probably uh, leave less money on the table when trying to predict the marketability of a, 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 a game. Monetization went way beyond, right? We see that many of our top games, which also was a surprise for us at Supersonic, few of our games are on scale for two and a half years already, right? Hide and Seek, for example, we launched it in April 2020. It's the third game that we launched. For two and a half years, it's already in the top charts. The late retention of, of day 180 is still significant. So installs we generated six or seven months ago are still generating revenue for us, even today. And this is because the game evolved a lot, and the meta and the progression, the amount of content changed a little bit how users interact with these games. And the user acquisition, of course, a lot has changed as well. If in the past you would have one bid, one CPI for hyper-casual game, because it's not casual, right? There are no wells dolphins and non-payers, you have the same guys, they watch ads, they, they generate money. It's not what really happens. And the revenue distribution per user for hyper-casual is the same as in casual. We have users that generate much greater LTV than others, depends on their, of course, engagement, session, and retention, but also the CPM and the quality they bring to different advertisers that show ads to. And we start predicting day 180 LTV, so today in Supersonic, day after the install, so in day zero, we already have some prediction of what the LTV is going to be in six months, and we are granularly bidding per quality of user for each sub uh, 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 source you can imagine. We are not bidding for this game 50 cents on Iron Source. We are bidding for each source within Iron Source. The quality creative has evolved a lot. Dan is going to touch it at the close of this day. Touch it here. Now let's look a little bit on a wider perspective, look a little bit of, da of data, and see what happens in the mobile ecosystem, hyper-casual, non-hyper-casual, do they impact each other, etc. Just a, a, a photo to show how, how big hyper-casual is. This is Q2 worldwide installs in the app economy, right? You can see that besides the big social platforms, which are Meta, Google, and, and, and TikTok, the biggest and the most into installed publishers are hyper-casual, right? You can see that also Supersonic is the, is the biggest, but, but, but even, even, even if you look at the other, it's a big chunk of what users downloaded in Q2 uh, uh, this year. So we took some, some data from, from several sources that I, I censored our uh, uh, different uh, uh, reports that we had, and we kind of analyzed different trends in the mobile games and hyper-casual specifically in the past 5.5 years from January 1st, 2017, till today. So what do we see? First of all, when the industry and the ecosystem grow, grew, so is this their share of voice. Today, hyper-casual represent 
around 40% of installs in the United States. It means that every second install of a game in the United States is a hyper-casual game that's being installed. I, in my eyes, it shows a lot about the demand, right? Users are looking, just like they are in TikTok and Instagram, they are looking for this product of short session entertainment that they can play and have fun between a, 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 a different parts of the day. We also see, by the way, which is stable in the past 1.5 years. So this growth in share of voice kind of stabilized on 40% and, and kind of stuck in this number for the past 1.5 years. What else do we see? These are installs you can see in blue, hypercasual, in orange, non hypercasual and in gray, uh, uh, all games. So hypercasual up until the, the, the COVID 2020, which was a peak year uh, with all lockdowns and everything, grew about 20% year over year. This is how mobile games grew, where hyper-casual was about 70% of this growth in terms of installs, right? Uh, 2020 was a peak in COVID. 2021, 2022, hyper-casual stopped uh, uh, growing in terms of installs, right? It's not revenue because CPMs and LTV and engagement and retention are evolving as well. But it stopped growing in terms of uh, uh, installs and non-hyper-casual actually saw a, a moderate uh, uh, decrease uh, since hypercasual uh, uh, stopped uh, uh, growing. And today, this is hypercasual, about 70 billion installs a year and about 2 to $2.5 billion revenue. And the question that I would ask is whether there is a correlation between the fact that when hypercasual grew a lot, non-hypercasual grew as well. Maybe it's just because both of them grew as part of the ecosystem and COVID, etc. or maybe they impact each other. We will try to analyze it. So what do we see? Let's look at the typical... SDK network, right? It can be Iron Source, Unity, AppLovin, uh, and, and, and many others. In general, what we see today is that hypercasual represents about 30% of the uh, uh, installs revenue impression that a specific ad network is generating in the mobile games ecosystem. As of today, IAP based or non hypercasual games are buying more than half of the impressions in hypercasual games. So it's not only moving users between hypercasual games, but Many advertisers are looking to buy their users, the users that they know, during, uh, 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 during the time they play hypercasual, and it only makes sense, right? As an advertiser, you want as many chances as possible to get to the right user at the right time, right? So you have the social platform, which many users spend a lot of time at. You have other games but that are similar to you, but not all of them are monetizing with ads, and maybe it's not that easy to access the users that you want via your competitor ads that are not monetizing with ads, it's impossible. But then you have hypercasual, which many users, and some of them are good users for IAP uh, uh, advertisers as well, are there. And if you can meet them in the right time, and in the right timing, you can drive an install to generate uh, important value for you. By the way, if you want to look how does it look for the impressions that are not being generated by hypercasual games, so IAP here is taking 87% of the uh, uh, demand for non-hypercasual supply. And if you put it into a formula, uh, uh, you, can, you, can, you can check me uh, after. In general, about 20% of the installs that IAP advertisers are getting from SDK network are coming from uh, um, hypercasual supply, which is incremental probably, right? Because it's social, a bit of non-hypercasual games and this, and generate a significant impact on the ability of IAP-based advertisers to grow their audience and to find more users in the right time. So this is conclusion number one, and, and, and we will touch it. In my eyes, the fact that hypercasual grew helped a lot for non-hypercasual to grow their uh, installs, and once it stopped growing, it, it, it has less growth in the supply and where they can meet them. We also see different, uh, 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 we also see different uh, trend in, in, in IAP revenue, and, and, and we see that there is some slowdown there. M M Mishka is talking about it uh, yesterday. I'm going to touch it in a, in a moment, but, but it makes sense after lockdowns, after IDFA, uh, after everything that happened in the past two years, that we see some uh, uh, slowdown there. And we see this coming also for CPMs, right? And it makes sense. If revenue per user is lower, if, uh, if engagement per product is lower, CPI are going down. Some advertisers also prioritize EBITDA versus growth, right? We're in years that all you need to do is to grow. If you go, 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 you are fine. You will raise money, you'll sell your company, uh, you will do very, very well. It changes now. And uh, advertisers change their uh, strategy as well. And we also see this coming into the ECPM that were, was growing constantly 
for a couple of years, and suddenly, right, it takes the, the other way around. You can also see it in the, in the public uh, earnings of, of Facebook or Snap or others that see the same impact on uh, CPM. And what does this mean to hypercasual? Where does hypercasual needs to go next in order to uh, keep going and keep offering value proposition to users? So first of all, I like every year that people think that this is the last year of hypercasual. He is going to die next year, but, uh, but suddenly he's going. Uh, uh, Eric here is, uh, is, has a lot of uh, optimism about it. Um, we believe that hypercasual is not going anywhere, right? Hypercasual serves 40% of the installs in the, in, in the US. There is demand from users for this type of entertainment, and we believe that nothing is going to change around that, right? Um, we actually think, again, unlike others, that for instance, what Google Play is doing with the better ad experience we think it's a positive thing. We think it, it's not going to kill hypercasual, vice versa. We think it's going to grow hypercasual because a better ad experience, which is needed from our eyes as well, but it's not something that we can do uh, uh, as a publisher. It's, nothing, it's something that needs to be done by either a a Apple uh, and Google because, again, even if we will offer a better ad experience in our games, when we advertise it, the user doesn't say, ah, this is supersonic, they have better ad experience, let's play this game. No. If the better ad experience will be implemented because the stores force it, then we believe that demand for hyper-casual games from users will increase even further. So we look at better ad experience as, a, as an opportunity. Not only that, and it's interesting, and, and Samantha maybe will be angry with me, we start A-B testing toward Google Changes, and we actually saw that, that better ad experience in many times and different and creative solutions that we had improved our LTV. And, and, and we are not only going to do it on, on Google Play, we're going to do it on iOS as well, because we see that it actually generates higher uh, LTV, but we'll touch that uh, in a couple of weeks. We don't want to give you all of our uh, Intel, uh, Intel and Intel. Um, with current CPMs, right, that are going down for who knows how long, it will be harder to generate mega hits with high LTV, right? We need to think about how we can push product and LTV further to still have these mega hits, even in an area or period of time where CPMs will be uh, uh, lower, and we need to uh, uh, push the hypercasual in general to a new layer, not instead of what, happen, what happens today. I think that what we see today, the runner, the simulation, the SMR will stay as they are. There is demand for this type of games. The execution level is only get, getting better. It isn't going anywhere. But we think that the new hypercasual, kind of hybrid casual subgenre is going to evolve, and it's going to be on ba based on the hypercasual fundamentals with a bit more product depth monetization and IAP. So first of all, in order to remain hyper-casual, if you remember how we started, it has to be short sessions, quick and easy onboarding. If it's not that, it's not hyper-casual, then it's a RPG, shooter, and different type of game. We still want to serve the same type of audience. We still want to serve the same type of entertainment need. Because of that, marketability will remain key. We still believe that any prototype, even in this hybrid casual world, needs to start at the same funnel as hypercasual start today with marketability test. Even if LTV will go up, and we'll see how, from 70 cent to $1, $1.5, it still requires mass audience to generate an interesting business model. Um, so we keep leaning on the great fundamentals of hypercasual today, which, by the way, they are expanding into non-hypercasual genres as well, quick prototyping for marketable concepts, sophisticated marketability tests, engaging in catchy core game, gameplay. These are on, not only hypercasual, they started in hypercasual, but they are expanding to more genres. And what we will see uh, different is product with better execution, content, depth, meta, monetization. We also feel that the ecosystem is ready for that, right? The first year of hypercasual was the first year for developers as well, right? The first year for them to develop games. Now there are Massive amount of developers out there that published one, two, three games. They gained experience, they, they, they made money, they grew the teams, and they are ready to step to the next phase in terms of product uh, uh, depth and, uh, and, and, and richness. And we already start seeing type of games that are uh, similar to that. Mob Control by Voodoo, I think it's a great example, and they did an amazing job there. It was launched as a typical hyper-casual game a year and a half ago, and, and, a, and a few months ago, they actually Change, they kept the game, the gameplay, the core, the mass appealing, everything that had in the hyper-casual version, but they just added much more depth. They, they, they took inspiration from other PvP successful games like Clash Royale. I invite you to, 
to download Mob Control and see what they did there. I think they did it very, very nice with cards and meta and progression and IAP monetization. And this is kind of adding another 20, 25% to your LTV by IAP probably helps to have better retention, long retention, and even making more money from the ads perspective while st still keeping the marketability power, the short sessions, the mass appealing to hundreds and tens of millions of uh, players out there, and a more extreme advantage, which in my eyes is more cl close to casual, but, but uh, uh, than to hyper-casual is, of course, Survivor.io, which you all uh, uh, know is, 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 is was launched a couple of weeks ago, is doing amazingly, about $1 million a day, even more than that, half from ads, uh, uh, half from IIP. What you can see here is there, two years ago, when Survivor.io started development, there are two big hyper-casual publishers that tested the exact same and, 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 and worked on the exact same core mechanic, but didn't took it to the next level in terms of depth and monetization and everything around that. And, and, and Survivor.io, in my eyes, is a game that you can play for so short sessions. You can uh, uh, understand what you need to do in 10 seconds and no need for tutorial or complexity. But on the other hand, it serves the need for users that want it to have a very deep, engagement and progression with the uh, game, and this is one of the reasons it succeeds uh, this way. So a short link, a public casual offers a unique experience, striding social and games. In the past few years, the ecosystem has grown to be rich and diverse. Growth in hyper casual has driven incremental growth in other genres that we are very, very confident about it. Industry trends are going to force a continued evolution in hyper casual with strong focus on product, and we believe for the next mega hits in the next year, two or three, this depth will be needed and will give the extra boost to, to, be, to build a real mega hit that can generate significant revenue. Thank you very much.